All right, guys, we are live. A live shows you watch where they come out and they say that. And hopefully all the technical difficulties of starting this up was all right. Okay, guys, first of all, it is my birthday. Uh, and I got to say that it was uh, sort of celebrated last night, uh, which was fantastic. And uh, we got a little bit of a hibachi dinner coming up on Sunday when we when everybody's able to do this. And uh, after, uh, you know, now that I'm like piling up the years and a little bit and stuff, I, I couldn't help but kind of reflect on how long I have been collecting the comics, reading the comics and looking at it. Uh, 1977 was when I started flipping through those little things. I was four years old, uh, bought my first comic with my money in 1979, had a ton of uh, pulp novels, magazines, Bronze Age, Silver Age books in the house, carried around in grocery bags, stuck everywhere, laid everywhere around. And to be as old as I am now and to see all this stuff. Hey, thanks for the happy birthday. Yeah, yeah. Anybody that's watching this that's been on the uh, social media and stuff, wish me a happy birthday. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Uh, Rob Rip is out there. But it just kind of amazes me all the changes and how long I've been doing this stuff. Um Going into my sixth decade, if that's right, of uh, collecting comics and the stuff that's going on. And it was really odd because I started thinking about all the books I had from a kid, all the box books that I had carried over from the uncle and the stepdad that ended up in the house, all the stuff I'd sold over the years. And it really amazes me because I started thinking about three or four books that are averaging about $700 now that I've had that I've got rid of. Um, yeah, we're having lighting issues, but it is what it is today. That's all there is to it, right? So, uh, last, so this last week at work, man, it was really weird how this has been a very strange week. Um, a couple months ago, I made some videos talking about Koopa coming and how, if it's the government, it's a big deal. And the reason I come from, from saying those things is from real life experience, because we ended up, uh, getting, uh, Medicaid audited where I work. They are there now. They have been there all week. Um, and it's finally starting to wind down a very stressful time. They go through everything, um, uh, going back, you know, possibly three years and, uh, they're talking about staying a second week cause they normally stay a week. Um, so yeah, I had like one day off, uh, which was this past Sunday. And then I was like, Oh great. My birthday's coming up when I finally realized it was coming up. And I was just sort of like, how's this week going to go? So with everything that was going on, uh, the fiance who is fantastic and cool, I think my phone's going off. It's an official Heller Mouse video now. Yeah, anyway. So anyway, she uh, she has been uh, doing things to make sure that the birthday was special, which was fantastic. We ended up having a date night. Um, and due to her being, you know, having to work the night shift and stuff as a nurse, um, uh, yeah, she, uh, delivered pretty good as soon as I got home. Uh, I got a bunch of gifts over here. I'm not going to show it, but I now have a wood burning fire pit, which is fantastic. I'm all about the outdoors. Um, we're going to get a few good burns going on in this thing. When I put it together, it's completely metal. We're going to have it outside. So there may be some, uh, fireside chat videos coming up in the future live streams, uh, on those good days. And if, you know. Uh, but I'm going to get a good few, a good few burns in this thing. That's uh, a wood burning kit. So I'm going to burn out the chemicals and stuff on the inside. I'm actually going to be cooking on the thing outside. Yes, you can grill outside, but it's another thing to have an open flame and a grill. And I know how to cut sticks and twigs and stuff to where I can, uh, actually, uh, you get two, uh, I'm going to give you a, a little lesson here. It's old as the hills and stuff. It's nothing amazing, but you get you some sticks and you get two of them to where you have the Y at the end, right? And you lay a stick over that and you can cut some other sticks where you can cut on them and you can like hang over them and you can hang stuff on them, pots and whatever on the main stick and cook over it and stuff. You don't just have to have a piece of metal to lay right down on top of it. So I'm really looking forward to that. All right. We got some people coming in. Hey, thanks, uh, John Jones. Appreciate it. another happy birthday. I appreciate it. I feel like milking it now and stuff, right? So, uh, you know, let's start slowly looking at the hall of stuff that's coming in, right? We got you know, the main stuff. Now, some of the stuff we got, I've got a few days earlier and there's some stories, but I'm just putting it all together, right? One of the first things I've, uh, I have here to show, I'm really not into the Funko Pops. This is my third one, but every now and then there is one that catches my eye that's very cool. 
And I've actually looked up the two that I want, and they seem to be going for $75, which blows my mind for what these are uh, because they're on the back of them. I'd like to get the, it's the Masters of the Universe Funko Pops, which I thought was very cool. And uh, the ones I really want to get is the Hordak and the Skeletor. Uh, Masters of the Universe is a big thing uh, in this house. was when I was a kid. And the coloring on this is very... Um, I'm going to have to look up and see what's going on here because it's a very light green for what this is supposed to be. But um, I'm all about the bad guys, you know. Uh, this is a, a Trap Jaw Funko Pop uh, that I thought was very cool. Get the glare off of there. Um, this is my third one. I have a Charlie Brown and I have a, what is that one from the little shop of horrors? Ar 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 Aubrey, Audrey, Audrey two, you know, but I have this one and I wouldn't mind getting, like I said, the, uh, Skeletor and the Hordak one, um, it's great designs and they speak to me. And we also go back to when I was a kid, uh, with these. So yeah, I got a little Funko pop to, uh, kind of put with the, uh, survivors up there. I'm still surrounded by the new universe books from my last live stream, right? Now, this is more the fiance's than it is mine, but it's ours in the house and stuff. Uh, I showed it to her because what is funny is that if you crack my fiance up just enough, you get her in those moments, uh, get her to watch a show called uh, What We Do in Shadows. Um, it's very odd stuff really cracks her up. Tell her cheesy jokes like... Um, what do computers eat for snacks? Uh, you know, microchips. Ha ha. She'll start cackling and sounding like uh, Skeletor, which was just so funny. But what we have here is what would Skeletor do? Uh, here for the first time, all, of all the diabolical wit and wisdom gleaned from Skeletor's unrelenting campaign to wreak havoc on the planet Eternia are collected into one practical and practically hilarious volume. This comical and empowering God places the evil Skeletor in a variety of troubling scenarios that will be familiar to any reader in chapters that relate to evil, every evil overlord's life, uh, from family and frenemies to career and downtime. And ask that all important question, what would Skeletor do? And this thing is hilarious. Uh, it's got a forward in here, but the one I, the one I was so glad we ended up getting this uh, was right in the middle of here about starting a new relationship. See if I can find it real quick. It should, it should open right to it because we've been laughing about it. <laughs> uh, to cover my throne with your hide. Home is where home is where the uh, hatred is. <laughs> it's so funny. Cracks me up. What do we got here? Mansplaining is necessary. <laughs> and usually well received. Not ag I agree. I agree. But anyway, this is funny. Hey, Comic Crypt of Castle Hills is here. Happy birthday, Timmy. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. Right now, here's an actual present that I got. I've wanted this for a while. I actually have a shelf uh, in here. You can actually kind of see it uh, right in there. That's a shelf of movies and stuff, man. But I'm really, it, it's really odd uh, as far as horror films and things like that, that go. I sort of tend for the weird, uh, but we finally had the complete series of the Twilight Zone. There's all kinds of places you can stream this and, and everything like that, but having the physical media in your hand um, is, is the way to go. And what I really like about this is, um, of course, it gives you a table of contents inside the sleeve, letting you know the seasons and you know the name of the shows. But uh, in blue, they've stuck out and put easy to find the really popular Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, the Living Dolls, The Fear, Will the Real Martian Please Stand Up, one of my favorites. Um, uh, Eye of the Beholder, which is fantastic. It has Ellie Mae before she was Ellie Mae. Nightmare at 20,000 Feet to Serve Man. It tells you, you know, they just stick right out. My favorite episode, not that anybody asked of uh, the classic Twilight Zone, is The Howling Man. Go figure. Uh, fantastic. Um, the opening shot is real innovative. It's, it's shot very cheap. Um, I, I think it's a fantastic story. Uh, it, I, I like those older shows where the writing makes up for the effects or the budget. You know what I'm saying? Land of the Lost, Star Trek to a certain to extent. Um you know, Twilight Zone. I, I, I will, I will, in Tom Baker, Doctor Who's, I will take good writing 
clever writing, innovative writing, world bidding, building. Uh, if you're not in the land of the lost from the seventies, that set that, uh, seventies, uh, cartoon, uh, live action Saturday morning show. Um, you need to watch the second season because they really did some world building there. Uh, it's dark and spooky and secretive, but the twilight zone to me, I love twilight zone, the night gallery, cold check, um, X files, tales of a uh, tales from the dark side. Uh, I also have this eighties twilight zone. Um, I'll throw supernatural in there. If I haven't said it yet, at least the first five seasons are brilliant. Um, if you, you have to watch them consecutively to get one big, huge story. Uh, but it's just fantastic. Uh, I just love this. But to me, this is, is the one. Now, a lot of people like The Outer Limits. I'll watch The Outer Limits if it's on. It, it, it's more hardcore sci-fi. But no matter how, no matter what the episodes are, when I watch it, I always feel like it, it's trying to be The Twilight Zone. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, just, just I was very happy to have this. Uh, I've been trying to keep an eye on it for a while. You know, try to find a decent price because I'm a cheap bastard. What do we got here? John Jones, I picked up Strike Force and Grant Morrison's run of Animal Man, really enjoying both series. That Animal Man series, I'm telling you, when you get around to issue 20 or 21, I think he wrote the first 26. Uh, Grant Morrison really, the, 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 what he did with that book in the last you know, five issues, I would say, uh, really pays off. Um, you're not going to believe what you're reading, I think, unless you've already heard about it. Hey, Paulo Costa wishes me a happy birthday. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Albert Bailey, I just got, uh, I just got, just got <laughs> a copy of Hell Arisen number three for cover price on eBay. The price is through the roof. Did you get one? No, I did not get one, Albert. Uh, believe it or not, I'm, I, I finally have a month where I'm buying zero uh, new comics. Um, for me personally, I know there's some good stuff out there. You really got to dig. It's innovative, but I'm really not wanting to be one of those channels if I can help it to where I just harp on how bad the comics are to me. Uh, to me, there's just really nothing creative going on over, over on. And after reading, uh, and it was sent to me, I know some, I know somebody was wanting me to do a video on it and stuff, but after see, finding out how, uh, what they're doing to Wolverine, Scott Summers and Jean Grey on the moon, I'm just like, that's, that's, that's the most ridiculous, stupid and um, what they're doing to him, I'm just, there's no interest there. I mean, that's not going to pull people in. It's going to pull in degenerates, um, people who uh, want to feel normal for things that they do. That's nobody's business. Uh, so um, I will check out Hill Arisen. I will uh, get online. Uh, I know a place I can see a pirated copy. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you most 80. I think it's like, I think they came up with uh, an actual number of, uh, while we don't really hear a lot about digital sales and I think it's something like 80 to 90% are pirated. Okay. So yeah. Um, Albert Bailey. Uh, thanks for the comment, man. Throw, throw it back in there. And we got bear cubster. Happy birthday. Thanks, man. Appreciate it, man. Appreciate it. Now this, there's a channel, my buddy, Steve Charlton 66. I think he's Charlton 66, 70, 6, 6, 7, 0 on Instagram and stuff. But a couple years ago, I was at his house. We were going, he was letting me stay with him. I drove up to Baltimore where he lives. And, uh, you know, we we're hanging out there, you know, when we're not at the con up in his comic book room and stuff. And he pulled out this amazing hardback. I wanted to say it looked familiar. And the only reason it would have looked familiar is because I flipped through the books when I was like five, six or seven years old. But he has a complete, this, this amazing dark horse collection of this character from Erie, uh, an old Warren publisher magazine all right archie goodwin was in that thing frank rosetta had a part in it howard check in a bunch of people were in these old horror 70s magazines you had eerie and creepy and they had their own hosts they were a bit of a throwback to the ec comics and they were in magazine form so they got around the comics code authority right but i love post-apocalyptic stuff that that could possibly be my favorite genre of anything um if i really had to like you know, drop a dime on it. Uh, you know, if you're on that island, you can eat one food. What is it? Well, if I'm on one island, what genre would I want? Would I want to watch? And that's it, right? But uh, this amazing character, Hunter. Uh, I have this on the Instagram. Uh, I put this on Instagram. If you want to go to Howler Mouse and jump on the Instagram, I, I show the cover, the back cover, and I give the little synopsis on the back to get you to, to write this. But this is fantastic. Paul Neary, Alex Nino did the art. Um, 
Of course, it's the hardback, the mandatory knock on the hardback. But these pages, black and white, um, let's just go ahead and take a look inside. Uh, the black and white stuff that, uh, you know, is a black and white magazine, but the black and white zip tone stuff that's in here also. But my God, uh, you know, as thin as this is, uh, it's very deceiving. First of all, I hope this is showing up because the light is shit in here. Uh, you know, front and inside cover all back. I love this stuff. I absolutely love this stuff, right? But um, the artwork in this and the stories, right? I know that's not going to be something. It's meant to be held close up. You're supposed to have this hands and to read it because it is chock full of story. You sit down and you read this. Whatever those magazines, I can't remember how much they were. I want to say two bucks off the top of my head back in the day. Mm. Uh, you got your money's worth on this, man. I mean, when you got mm. these, you didn't sit down and read a comic. You know, you read a comic now, it's two to three minutes. Uh, you sit down and you read this, and you're really invested there for a while. So thank you, uh, Charlton66, for turning this on to me. Thank you to the fiance for ordering this for me. And it came in a couple days before my birthday. Um, it's set in front of me. Uh, on the table uh, that is probably uh, I'm going to be getting rid of probably, you know, I've got, I have shelves all around me, but something's coming off the rack. I may be getting, giving up my three or four volumes of why the last man uh, I've had the, why the last man trades is so funny. I've had them sold them, had them sold them. I've read the whole series twice. Um, and uh, I'm probably going to get rid of them again and start making some room for the stuff we have here. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Anyway, now these next two came from the date night before the birthday. Okay. Uh, we were out there and um, what's up guys. We're just going to set this over here. Let me check out the comments here. Uh, Paulo Costo is that Esteban, um, uh, Morato. Uh, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I know it looks like it. I know, I know exactly who you're talking about. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you who the creator is and we're going to move on here. The phone is going off. Yeah. It's Paul Neary. Like I said, Paul Neary, Bud Lewis, Marino, not Marino, Al Sanchez, Ken Kelly. Nope. Nope, it's just that style from back in the day. Um, you know, probably that. But I totally, I totally get how, how where, where I'm showing it and it comes off looking like that. They're very similar, I think. Very similar proportions and anatomy wise. That's the huge difference, angles and stuff. <laughs> it's a live Haller Mouse show and people are trying to get a hold of me. All righty. Now, like I said, uh, these were from Books A Million. One was on sale. We had a $5 gift card and we also had the uh, membership card. Uh, it's not actually mine, but, you know, I got to use it and stuff, right? And, uh, you know, sort of these are, I'm counting these as birthday presents, right? But this is fantastic. I love this volume. These are in cover. And they also have these 70s black and white horror magazines in the back of them. But this is the second volume of The Tomb of Dracula by Barbara Wolf and Gene Colan. And who I consider the greatest inker of all time in comics. Uh, and there's that, and that's not slighting any of the other ones and stuff. But Tom Palmer. <laughs> God. Try that again. There we go. But this is Tom Palmer's this is volume two. I may want to get volume one a couple of years ago. Now these, these, I still have some Tuma Dracula issues from when I was a kid that were in the house. Right. Um, like I said, the horror stuff was all over the place with the comics and the heavy metals and stuff like that. So I still have a few, but a couple of years ago at the Hillsville flea market where they turn in Virginia, where they turn twice a year, they turn the whole town into a flea market. I had just bought something like Hellblazer number one at a vendor, bought some stuff was getting towards the end of the day. And I just happened to look in uh, on this one guy's stuff on my way out. And he had a stack of near mint uh, Tomb of Dracula's for a dollar. Now you got to understand a million people come through this place in three or four days when they do this uh, is what they say. 
so it's very crowded and I had, I had to make some tough choices, man. I had to make some tough choices. Uh, ended up not getting the books. Didn't really regret it too much because I ended up getting like Hellblazer number one and a few other things. Right. Uh, but to have this in color, knowing that it's out here like this in color, I'm totally down with this, having th these. Uh, and actually a lot of these images in here just take me back uh, to me just sitting on my bed as a little kid going back and forth through them. Um, when I see these, uh, I have the, uh, I have almost a full set of the Bronze Age Frankenstein uh, that started out with Mike Plugark. This, this also has the crossover where the monster's Frankenstein's monster, but this is the gold for me. Uh, the Dracula Lives magazine is in the back here with some black and white Gene Colon art. I mean, look at that. That is a tattoo waiting to happen, my friends. Look at that. Ink wash. It's fantastic, right? That's the stuff. That's the stuff that keeps me going. All right, we're good here, right? So, yeah, this was great. This was 10 bucks. 10 bucks for this, right? This is volume two. And, um, you know, they have a lot. There's on the inside, they're advertising quite a few of these uh, collected editions of the 70s Bronze Age stuff. Man thing. I have the Mike Plug Frankenstein here somewhere. Um, Werewolf by Night apparently is also, has also been collected. Now, I know this isn't news to a lot of people, but, uh, you know, I haven't really been active in looking for things that are coming out here. So that was fantastic to find. Now, this one here, I've decided I'm going to keep it. Okay, because I was very uh, disappointed when I got home, but there was nothing I could do. I took a leap of faith, and the leap of faith blew up in my face. So uh, what we have here is the Fantastic Four Behold Galactus. Now, this is very cool in itself, right? Because I love my Galactus, right? Galactus, Doctor Doom, two of my favorite Marvel characters, okay, uh, with the thing. Um, but on the back of this, you're going to see it's a Books a Million. I moved one of the stickers. I thought I'm just taking it all the way off. Right. But uh, down here where it tells you what the books are that it reprints in here, it had another sticker. You cannot take these stickers off while you're in the store. Right. So I was reading through here and I was able to peek in there and I saw Fantastic Four, 48, 49 and 50. First appearance of Silver Surfer, Galactus, the fantastic Stan Lee, um, Jack Kirby story were to me, in my opinion, that is where Marvel elevated themselves into the actual number one company at that time with that story. That story ended up being a lot of uh, undertones in it that were very sophisticated. Basically, uh, in my mind, Jack Kirby, you know, read the Bible a little bit, read something, and Galaxus was his vision of God. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's, it can be deep stuff if you really dig into it. Hey, Gretzky's here. What's going on? Benji76 is here. Thanks for the, hey, thanks, man. Thanks for the happy birthday. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, so it has that story. Then it has one of my favorite stories because I had the Marvel Treasury Edition in my house that I would read and reread. And it's the um, uh, Fantastic Four 120 through 123 where John Bashima and Stan Lee bring in Galactus. And they have Gabriel the Airwalker who's replaced the Silver Surfer as his... Um, Harold and I love that character. Um, Gabriel the Airwalker is one of those characters where I'm just like, I'm so glad he's not been exploited. I think he's come back maybe once or twice. He fought Thor, and I think Ron Mars brought him into the Silver Surfer a little bit with a Harold story where he brought in all the Galactus Heralds, which, yeah, that sounds fun, but I was like, really? Uh, it's kind of forced a little bit, I think. But anyway, but I love Gabriel the Airwalker. His whole spiel was, is, uh, in this, like I said, it has the, whenever you, whenever Stanley brought in Galactus and he's going to bring in Silver Surfer, you got these religious overtones, but uh, the Airwalker as a herald would walk in and he announced he was an angel. Then he would, he announced that he was Gabriel, the angel, and he whipped out his horn and blew it because he was calling down judgment day and everybody was freaking out. Um, you know, and it ends up, it's Galactus. If you go back and read the first appearance of Silver Surfer and uh, Galactus coming, there was fire in the sky and rocks floating in the sky. They were all illusions, and it was the Watcher trying to hide Earth. But that's from the book of uh, Revelations, too. You know? uh, so that's a great story. I didn't, didn't mean to give a sermon here. I'm not the man to do that. Then it also has John Byrne's story from 242 to 244, which is where we got Nova, the first appearance of Nova. And he brought in... Um, 
a bunch of heroes to come in and actually help the Fantastic Four take on Galactus. Reed Richards, I believe that's where Reed Richards saved Galactus, and we ended up having the trial of Reed Richards later on. Uh, this is John Byrne classic stuff. Um, so it's great stuff, but here's where I got burned because it says illustrated. You can make out the word illustrated, but the sticker and then the sticker that was here, I could just, I couldn't, you know, I see it starts with L U S T R. I thought I'm like, this may have the Epic illustrated last, uh, story of Galactus from Epic illustrated. I'm like, I would have known about this. I would have known about this. And at the time where it was, at the time, it was not a possible, a real possibility for me to stop everything and start Googling and trying to find this and stuff, right? And no, it's not in there because after I removed the sticker, it's illustrated by Jack Kirby, John Bushima, and Byrne. They didn't even spell out the, all of Byrne's name. <laughs> it does not say John Byrne. It just says Byrne. Um, so, yeah, that was a little bit of a disappointment. I thought they finally did it. They finally collected and finished and had the pages or whatever for the last Galactus story. Oh, well, and I was like, you know what? I might take that back. Now that I've had a day or two to think about it, I'm just going to keep it, chalk it up to a little bit of wasted money. All right. But this is going to be good. This is a Marvel Select Edition hardback. I haven't opened it yet. It's going to be getting open tonight. Who would have got out there, man? Hey, Charlton66 is here. I've already talked about you in the Hunter hardback book that I told him from uh, Erie. Uh, Dark Horse, you know, collected the Hunter series. Told him how you turned me on to it, man. So thanks for the happy birthday and turned me on to that book. Albert Bailey, did you get the Batman 89 2 with the punchline cameo too? No, Albert, I did not get that. <laughs> I actually have seen people on Facebook, which blew my mind, asking if anybody had one for cover price and stuff. Uh, Joker gets a new girlfriend. And I tell you what I'm nervous about here, right? Uh, whoever this punchline is, you know, big deal. Uh, Crypt, uh, oh, he's in here. Comic Crypt of Castle Hill. You need to chime in there because I can't remember if it was on a social media, Facebook, uh, Instagram, or if you made an actual video where you showed where that character is ripped off. Much like uh, the Batman who smiles is uh, Judge, you know, Judge Death from uh, Judge Dredd, dropping dimes all over the place. But what I'm really nervous about is uh, even though Dan Didio has been removed, uh, been a week now, tomorrow makes a week that it was announced, was removed from D.C., They've been talking about that fifth generation or 5G or whatever you want to do. The problem with this is that whenever there's a reboot coming or a revamp or the DC takes a new direction, uh, they got by with it back in the 80s with Christ on Infinite Earth. That's why we had this amazing uh, trial of the Flash, a trial of Barry Allen story where they changed him with plastic surgery. He went from blonde to uh, looking like a crow magnum caveman with a black flat top. Uh, but basically what happens is whenever, in my opinion, whenever there's a big reboot or a revamp coming on, the comic's coming out uh, six months to nine months before that re revamp and reboot and redirection of a company are just filler. Um, you know, they it doesn't matter because when they do the reboot and the revamp, whatever you're following now is not going to matter. They're starting everything fresh and new. So that's another reason why I'm not feeling it going out there and that's the only book I would probably get right now is the Batman adventures six issue miniseries. That's going to be starting in about two months uh, where Paul Denny comes on there and it's based on the nineties cartoon show. Oh, comic crypt Hill is there. Uh, comic crypt of castle Hills, uh, executive assistant Iris. Yeah. He's the man that uh, busted that wide open in my eyes. So that's his area. Go to his channel and check it out. Scott Neely made it home. All right. Awesome. Okay, guys. Oh, man. Hey, rumor has it that Dan Didio was not nice to workers. Yeah, uh, part of what came out about Dan Didio being let go is uh, apparently a bunch of editors had left over the past, I don't know, six months or so. And, a lot, and apparently some people had allegedly gone to HR and said that the, it was just not a very nice work environment. So we'll see what that means. I mean, I come from an era where you can get on to people's butts a little bit to get them motivated. Uh, so I don't know if that's a generational thing of you get your workers going or uh, and, you, and you be a boss or if Dan Didio really did have a problem. So far, I've really, despite people not liking his comics, I have never heard of any stories in 22. When, when did he come? He, take, he popped up like in 2002 or something uh, with uh, 
with all the YouTube channels and how everybody hashes out the comic book news, like the Inquirer and all that stuff nowadays, and with social media and Ain't It Cool News and Bleeding Cool and all these other sites and Wizard Magazine and stuff, there was never uh, anybody saying anything terrible about Nandidio that has popped up in, we'll say, 18 years. So I'm not one to say what was going on, but it's kind of funny that comes up now uh, when they want to wanted to get rid of them. I don't know. I don't know. I'm skeptical. You know, uh, I can, I've seen more things about dance. I almost did it, but uh, let's just say the first time I saw somebody in comics actually uh, be, uh, you know, a total ass towards fans and customers and stuff was Dan Slott. And there's plenty of videos out there about and naming names of people who have been horrible on Twitter uh, the last couple of years, people I blocked before comics Kate became a thing like Jody Hauser and a few other people and stuff. Right. So for them to say that about Dan Didio, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's padding the reasons, making the case to get rid of them, you know, to kind of cover themselves. What do we got here? Scott Neely. Oh yes. I did subscribe to the Batman comic of the cartoon six issues. I might do it. I still have time. I have it at the end of the month with my G Mart online comic book shop. I might do it. I might do it. Um, yeah, I might do it. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of that cartoon series. Uh, just love it. Also power pack six issue series. Scott Neely is all over that. Apparently cool, man. Not a power pack fan back in the day. Didn't dislike them or not like them. They just never really grabbed my attention, but I love uh, John Bogdan Bog the Nub. I'm terrible with names tonight, man, but uh, I loved his artwork on it. Uh, Paulo Costa Didio was like an executive producer who thought he was creative. Yeah, you hire people to be creative, and then you want to do their job. That uh, uh, the only reason I will say that is if I did have his job, and I'm not saying I could do his job. My first thing is, is you guys are the creators impress me. I mean, I would be on them. You know, like, you know, one of the best things I ever heard was from uh, John Chris Falusi. Uh, he is the guy that did the Mighty Mouse cartoon with Ralph Bakshi uh, back in the 80s. But he's famous for his Ren and Stimpy. And one of the things he did with his artists is they were never allowed to draw Ren and Stimpy uh, the same way twice every picture of Ren and Stimpy that was turned into him had to be different from anything they'd done before. That's what I'm talking about. Mike Gretzky, fire Dan Slott. I mean, you know, if that's why they're going after Didio for, you know, if they're going to bring that up, there's plenty of other people to throw that at. Albert Bailey, you mean the DC re reboot will be to kill off Bruce Wayne, Clark Kent, Diana? How long, uh, how long would that be for? It's up in the air, man. Uh, Albert Bailey is uh, talking about the future here. Uh, there's articles coming out talking about 5G that's been out there. And right now we're in, in my opinion, the rumor area of news. Um, all they've really, the only facts that we really have is that Dan Slot showed up for, I mean, Dan Slot, Dan Didio showed up for work. Uh, by the end of the day, he was fired. Uh, it was told that it was unceremoniously. And then Jim Lee comes out and the only thing we know is that he's not going to be replaced. Uh, some people said the 5G thing was why he was let go. Yet other people are saying 5G is still happening. We're in the rumor area of what's going on. Uh, Scott Neely. And, and, you know, I can go on with the rumors, but everything we've had is a rumor so far. Scott Neely. I went to the thrift shop near my job and got over 40 one dollar comics, lots of old and gold stuff. And that's how you do it, folks. That's how you do it. Get out there and find those deals and hit those little uh, honey honey spots if you can find them. Mike Gretzky never got into Power Pack. Uh, I didn't know anybody into Power Pack, but I never really saw it on the stands that much also. Uh, when it was on the spinner rack, it might have been every three or four months. Uh, the only time I really saw it was when the Mutant Massacre was going on. Uh, from 86, 1986, the Mutant Massacre. X-Men 210 to 212 for you people out there and with all the X-Men books. Uh, and a Thor and some Thor. Mike Gretzky, watch some other company hire Dan Didio. I, you know, I'm one of the guys that's it's not so much that I want to take up for Dan Didio. Um, some of the choices he did were horrible out there, but he did bring some good talent in. I mean, the thing is, is I'm not saying that he was balanced with his good choices and bad choices, but did Didio brought in some good people? There was a handful of good ideas that were out there that he did. He wasn't an absolute, uh, in my in my opinion, he was not an absolute uh, 
klutz with his job. You know what I mean? Uh, I, I think he had areas he was competent. Um, I hope he stays involved with uh, comics in some ways because we're seriously, how many people have his energy and take comics as serious as he does? You know what I mean? Uh, I think he just kind of lost his way a little bit. Okay. A little bit. Listen to me. Okay. I'm going to get back to the hall here in a minute. I'm just going through the uh, comments here. Paulo Costa, I was always under the impression 5G was going to be a storyline set in the future. Besides, they seem to be giving Sean Murphy his own chronology uh, chronology to uh, run. Sean Murphy is getting his own White Knight universe based off his Batman the White Knight uh, miniseries. Uh, Scott Neely, hey, I got it. And as far as 5G being a storyline, I heard it was a storyline. I've seen stuff saying that Dan Didio is determined to change it like he did DC 52 and have it be permanent. It's up in the air. And one of the things I did hear rumor wise is that where he's changing so many of the her heroes, uh, the marketing department for DC, it's like, how are we going to push our merchandise if you change all the heroes in the comics? He didn't think that through. That's also what happened when they killed Robin with Jim Starlin, which is one of the reasons he ended up going to Marvel, ended up doing Infinity Gauntlet and didn't work for DC for decades. Uh, Scott Neely. Hey, I got an old Legion of Superheroes comic. You're talking my language from the early 80s. That's that's filled a gap. Uh, I'll do a video later if I can. I have a major migraine. Scott Neely, you do a Legion of Superheroes video. I'm there. All right. I am there. I'll, I'll be looking for that uh, this weekend or you can message me uh, wherever you can find me. Let me know you got it up. Okay, John Jones, I'm a fan of Jim Lee. I say give him the full publisher role. Hey, you know, uh, Mike Gretzky, uh, 5G is in the DC solicitation. Oh, no. Albert Bailey, reading the new Hellblazer from the Sandman universe. I dropped all the new Sandman universe. <laughs> uh, I have uh, probably, I'm probably missing, I don't know, I'm going to say 70 issues of the original Hellblazer series. Uh, maybe one day I'll check it out. Uh, Paulo Costa, Scott, Scott, um, EVS, okay, Ethan Van Skyver, EVS must be, it's Ethan Van Skyver, has a bunch of videos complaining about the Menage a Loon. Uh, you can watch those. <laughs> a lot of people, uh, I've mentioned it. That's why I like YouTube. I do document these things. It's just a matter of finding them. I was uh, subscribed to Ethan Van Skyver when he was on Facebook back in 2009 and 2010 maybe one in 2011, he would set up a camera, play his little keyboard piano, sing songs about Wolverine, about superheroes being gay. He would make fun of the uh, UPS driver. He was with, a, I don't know if it was his first wife or whatever. She was uh, some girl that went to a private school and she would get on there and talk about guns. And I'm not just talking about guns. I'm talking about like she had the make model and how you can switch them around and stuff like that. And, uh, Ethan Van Skyrim, let's just say that I ended up unfollowing him on Facebook. So when he got his, when he got his, when he got his YouTube channel coming, I kind of had an idea of what was coming. I, I mean, apparently I need to start watching him. Uh, Apollo, you, or maybe somebody else. Anyway, you're, this is the second or third person telling me to go check out Ethan Van Skyrim videos about things. It might, may, I think I watched one. It may be time. Uh, I got my Phyllis Ethan Van Skyver his character online, if you will. I got, I got my feel back on Facebook, uh, in, in the two thousands, uh, Scott Neely, Paula Costo. I saw your boy Zach's video about it. Oh, that, okay. Diversity in comics. I got you. Paulo Costo, Jim Lee's, uh, VP role has always been decorative. It's how DC paid him for buying Wildstorm. He doesn't currently have to work. And we have Chris Lackey here. Hey, what's up, man? All right. Moving on back to the hall here. That was fun. Keep it rolling guys. Keep it rolling here. Now, this is something that I picked up, uh, and it's funny how I picked up. Um, I actually ended up ordering this, and I paid more than I actually would ever do it, even though shipping on the handle is coming on. But through no fault of Rick Rick Vetch, Vitch, no fault of Rick Vetch, this actual the person who wrote and drew this, uh, with a lot of other people doing uh, backup stories and helping up things. Uh, Hillary Barda, Dave Gibbons. I think Dave Gibbons wrote a backup story in this. Al Williamson, one of my favorites. Frank Cho, Russ Heath, another one of my favorites. John Severin and Alan Moore. Uh, I think they're all doing backup stories in this. But this was a four to six issue miniseries. 
And when Rick Vetch, who I have on Facebook, because he actually posts uh, original art on there, old comics and stuff, tells little stories in them. He's very cool to talk to on Facebook and to follow on Facebook. He came up and uh, I think he put a, an original page of this up. Uh, this is uh, the gray shirt, the Indigo Sunset from ABC Comics, America's Best Comics, uh, when it was a Wildstorm imprint and then DC ended up buying Wildstorm. But he did a miniseries. This character was in Tomorrow's Stories, and it's an ode, if you will, to the spirit. Will Eisner's the spirit. But anyway, he was online and he said he found a box of these that he still had. And for some, and he sold, he told the price that he would sell it to you and sign it and, uh, you know, everything all together. And I was thinking for that price, I'm like, that's got to be a hardback. You know, I was like, okay. So I did an impulse buy. I did an impulse buy. I'm like a signed trade by Rick Veitch. Yeah, I'm down for it, right? Comes in. It's got a little bit of a mildewy smell, but, you know, it's not too bad. It's already gone away. Maybe it's just the paper quality and maybe the ink are smelling funny. But it doesn't smell mildewy now, so I'll let it go. It's, uh, it's a flimsy uh, little trade here. And when he signed it, this is his signature. I was very, um, let's just say I was underwhelmed. That's the word. So I paid for all that. But the story is solid. It's very good. Um, Rick Veitch does a great job of capturing, capturing an era when he does the artwork in these. Uh, if you followed him with uh, Supreme with Alan Moore. But uh, he writes our uh, gray shirt and his buddy. Uh, he draws the first story like it's a 1950s. 1960s comic and we have a they may resemble Archie and Jughead I don't know I thought it was Bart Simpson when I first saw it and then I saw the nose uh, you know fighting monsters that go through the 70s uh, into the 80s about this monster and it's full of backup stuff like you saw in Watchmen newspaper strips and things that enhance the story and then like I said each issue apparently had a, had a uh, backup story in it Here's like young, great, young. The backup stories are called Young Gray Shirt. Here's one from 1989. Apparently, Gray Shirt ages in real time. All right. What do we got here? Mr. Gretzky says, I'm glad I don't uh, get DC books since 2016. Scott Neely uh, from Gretzky, uh, get the 50s, get the 50 rebirth Superman comics by Tumasi. They are worth it. Now, we go ahead and tell you the DC Rebirth books, uh, the first year or two of those, I thought they were really good. Tumasi is a solid writer. It's getting dark on us, guys. Uh, let me know if you can still see me. Uh, Paulo Costa, uh, say, the formerly French exclusive Conan books have finally reached the U.S. this week. Ablaze Publishing put out the first issue of Queen of the Black Coast. I'm going to have to write that down before I get off here. I'm definitely down for some real Conan books. Uh, Paulo Costa, I totally recommend these. I've been buying the French editions. They're adapted directly from the REH stories, Robert E. Howard stories. That's fantastic. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, Scott Neely, oh man, Mildew, I passed on some Impulse comics today uh, due to water damage inside the plastic cover. Not worth getting it back. Yeah, but I, you know, I'm digressing. I'm smelling them now. There's no Mildew smell. I'm thinking maybe they were just musty in the box and they just aired out uh in other words, uh, you know, I might have just been a little uh, pissy when I got them. Now, something I got, uh, I had the first issue of this. If you watched me for a while, I think it was last year I talked about it. James Robinson, who uh, one of my favorite writers, who wrote my one of my favorite series. It goes back and forth between Starman of the 90s and Commandy. And what my favorite series is. I uh, did Starman, of course. And apparently Jeff Lemire has his Black Hammer books, which are odes or whatever to, uh, you know, other comic book heroes, mainly DC from what I've seen. I have, really haven't read a lot of the Black Hammer books, but I had to get this one. And I got the first issue, checked it out last year. It was great. I was getting in to kind of skip over that. I was really excited about James Robinson showing up at Heroes Con. Uh, it was all the way announced and stuff. And just a few days before Heroes Con, he canceled. Uh, Tony Harris, who helped co-create and drew, you know, I don't know, the first third of the book or whatever of Starman, uh, he's a mainstay down there, right? With his Jolly Roger Studios uh, booth and all this stuff, right? So I'm like, oh man, James Robinson's going to be there, you know, and all that stuff. And he quit. And I did a joke video, like, you know, he was cheating on us with another Heroes Con stuff. And I made the joke to him, like, I'm glad I've been uh, reading Dr. Star, right? 
I've read the first issue again of this. Uh, it's a collected edition. I got this super cheap, maybe off Amazon or something. I don't know. I think it was $5 with shipping and handling or something. I don't know, man, but I couldn't pass it up. It was super cheap. I got this. It's really good. And after reading uh, some of the notes in here and the extras in here, it turns out they made Dr. Star look like James Robinson. Now that's an ode. This is, this is an unapologetic ode to Dr. Star. Okay. Uh, to Dr. Star, to Starman, uh, going all the way back to the forties with the original Starman. This is really cool. And it's a really, it's a really messed up, sad, emotional story. Uh, basically he goes off into space and thanks to the relativity of time, he goes off into space and he thinks he's coming back in the same afternoon. And it turns out it's 18 years later. His kid grew up, his wife's left him. They hate him. It's pretty bad. And the way, th and from what I can tell, uh, his kid is apparently he traveled a bit more. I'm waiting to see, but he, uh, he's older than his kid now, you know, his kid is older than him now is what I meant to say. Yeah, French comics are fantastic. Uh, the, the the European comics. I, I wish I could explain to anybody who has grown up and you know are used to European comics what a treat they are. If you're on this side of the ocean, when you can find some, I mean, it's just it's amazing. What we got here, Scott Neely. Oh, my local comic book shop just got some old Marvel Doctor Who comics that I never knew existed. They were based on the Doctor of the late 70s with the scarf. I think those were in Marvel Premiere reprinted over here. I've got some collections somewhere on my shelf over here of uh, some of that stuff that they had. Um, what was the magazine they were in? It's from the tip of my tongue. But yeah, they're pretty good. Uh, I think Dave Gibbons did some of the art in those. Uh, there's an Alan Moore, uh, Grant Morrison. Uh, he didn't do Tom Baker, I don't think. Yeah. But anyway, Grant Morrison did some Doctor Who's. Um, there's an Alan Moore story that I think I have. That I would love to find. Okay. Now, the last thing I got, this is an Ollie's deal. And if you guys know Ollie's, you've heard me talk about Ollie's. Um, and uh, I, I walked around in there about two years ago. Ollie's ended up buying something like what was it, 15 million? I don't know, 15 million uh, hardbacks, uh, trades and stuff from a DC uh, storehouse, warehouses, or whatever they did. And they had some fantastic deals. I mean, you were getting stuff at 75, 80 percent off, and the, the videos were up, and there was some fantastic trades and stuff. Well, they're still getting some. They started getting the Marvel stuff off and on, uh, at least the Ollies around here. They always got comics and in, in, uh, trades and stuff, but not in the amount and the quality of books that you know started happening in the last couple of years. But something about the Marvel books that they get, they don't mark down like they did the DC. So who knows, right? But I had to pick this up. The Marvel apparently is uh, reprinting a lot of stuff that you could have got at Dark Horse over the years when they had the license for so long after... Uh, Marvel let you know, let it go or contract was up or whatever, but Dark Horse picked it up. They did some amazing uh, Star Wars stuff, right? But we're going even further back with this. This is volume one, and I'm hoping it's it's a complete. Uh, I'm not sure, but uh, Star Wars was in a comic strip uh, form in newspapers. Didn't come around here when I was growing up, right? And now I have uh, the epic collection, the newspaper strips, and their Legends line, Star Wars Legends line, right? This thing was super cheap, uh, maybe six bucks. And it was originally a $40 book. Might've been five or six bucks. I don't know. So, I mean, I got a great price on it and this was a $40 book, but uh, what, what, you know, this, uh, this is stuff's been uh, collected before. I have loose issues of this from dark horse, classic star Wars, the early adventures one through nine. I have some of those classic star Wars, Han Solo at the end, classic star Wars, one, two, three material from classic star Wars and the, Sunday newspaper strips, uh, March 11th to September, 1979. Uh, and then there was another collection. This collects, uh, from August 11th to October 5th, 1980. So I'm really hoping this, it says volume one, but I'm hoping this is almost all of it, but at towards the end of the strip from what I remember and understand, because we didn't have it in my newspaper around here, uh, Al Williamson came on here and this is before he books for me, which blew my mind. This is how my mind works. Okay. Alex Raymond, Flash Gordon, Al Williamson ended up taking over Flash Gordon, King Comics and other places. Flash Gordon influences Star Wars big time, unapologetically, the movie serials and specifically. 
So we have Flash Gordon inspires Star Wars, Star Wars going on, and all of a sudden Alan Williamson comes up, the guy who worked on the character that inspired the Star Wars thing. It was a match made in heaven, and to me, he has a photorealistic style where he can do the blacks and the grays and stuff uh, that I think is just fantastic. Uh, so Alan Williamson on Star Wars just blows me away. I've uh, been like that since I was a kid. Uh, I started understanding who some of these people were. And uh, so that's just fantastic. Um, trying to see if that is everything. I know there's something I forget, and there's something floating around here. But I think that's it for this haul. Now, there's something going around where there's a tag video. Uh, maybe I'll do a live show of it. I found the original video, but apparently you guys know that I do not embrace the terms nerd and geek uh, because I think that helps with the stigma of, comic book collecting actually kind of hurts the hobby, but the people who are in it, you know, a lot of people embraced it. Geek chic has been a word, all that stuff, whatever. But apparently there's a tag going around. I think it's 25 questions you ask and it's like a test um, uh, to see if you are an official comic book nerd. I watched a little bit of Charlton 66 do it. Um, and then during lunch today, and then he named the original person who did it. And that original person had in there, you know, anybody can do this. You don't have to be tagged. So if you guys want me to do a live stream of the 25 questions, just let me know. I might pop back up here tonight. Um, I'm going to eat dinner and get recharged, put some of this stuff up and uh, might play around with that. I think I can pull the questions up on my phone. It's all up to you guys. It's a Thursday night. We're supposed to be getting a snowstorm here this weekend again. <laughs> so that'll be the second one in a week. I've heard one to three, four to six inches. No idea how that's going to affect the internet. So why not? Um, I think I'm by myself this weekend too. I'm not sure. I've got a few things to do, but I'll probably be home. Uh, Charlton 66. Yes, do the live stream. Scott Neely. Snow? Yes, snow. Well, Charlton 66, that's all I need to hear. Uh, I find, I, I binge watch your videos here and there, even though, I, you know, but I get a time, I'll end up watching two or three of your videos at a time. And it seems like you've just led me. This has been the week of Charles on 66 leading me around here a little bit. Comic Crypt of Castle Hills. Great haul, Tim. Thanks for sharing. Happy birthday. Thanks, guys. I appreciate all the happy birthdays that come up here. Uh, thanks for sitting with me, jabbering. Thanks while we've sat here and gotten, it's gotten dark outside. Uh, Scott Neely, I'm not far from you in North Carolina. We're just getting rain. We've had rain off and on here, too. Uh yeah, I'm higher up in the mountains uh, down here in the part of Virginia that I'm in, uh, which is amazing. So that that elevation makes a difference, Scott. That's why we get the bad weather compared to you guys down there in the flatlands. Okay. All right, guys. Thanks for sticking in. Thanks for hanging out. Great to see every one of you. Uh, check Scott Neely, Charlton66, uh, Gretzky. I think, I think Gretzky's got a channel. Everybody's got a channel in these comments, man. Everybody uh, turn on the... If you're not watching this live, turn on the live stream. Subscribe to every one of these guys. These are all knowledgeable guys that know what they're doing. Um, and I appreciate every one of them. Uh, Charlton66, I've watched his channel just grow, take off. and I, It's great. Uh, uh, Comic Crypt of Castle Hills, I always smile when I see one of his videos coming up. Scott Neely and them. I mean, I've, you know, I check out all these guys. All right. What we got here? Scott Neely. Oh, yeah. My dad said Thomasville is getting snow. All right. We're going to end up being a bunch of uh, an Appalachian boy and a Southern boy sitting here talking about the weather. Surprise. If we don't watch, it's what we do. Uh, but OK, guys. But that's it. Be excellent to each other. And I'll do that stream tonight. Uh, of the uh, am I a comic book nerd uh, chat? And I'll try not to be preachy in it. All right, guys. Thanks for the happy birthdays. Thanks for checking in. Thanks for being here like subscribe share hit the bell so you know when i'm on here uh this has been the first live stream in a while where everybody didn't pop up in the end of it scott nelly party on thanks for the happy birthday guys later